The year is 1958. As a weather observer, I joined the Antarctic Division and spent the next 12 months with 15 other explorers at Macquarie Island. Macquarie Island is a sub-Antarctic wildlife paradise. It's about 35 kilometers long, a width of 5 kilometers, and the highest elevation is about 410 meters. It's about 1500 kilometers southwest of Tasmania, and the relation to Antarctica has over 300 days of rain and drizzle. The average temperature is about 14.4 degrees, it has a rainfall per day of 862 millimetres. It supports 3.5 million seabirds, and I'm sure that includes penguins. And I would say the largest royal penguin colony in the world on the other end of the island of some 800,000. Has some 80,000 southern elephant seals. At that time, the Australian government hired Danish icebreakers the Thalodan and the Kistadan to take the expeditions down to Antarctica, saying farewell to my mother. Icebreakers are built so that they climb onto the ice and break the ice. And because the bow is round, they roll about seven times a minute in the open water. But once in rough water, and I'm talking about the roughest ocean on this planet, it didn't affect me at all. At times it was very, very scary, but I didn't get too sick. The red circle indicates the main base. Now here we arrive at Macquarie Island and the background you see the plateau and of course the unloading starts to get all the material ashore for the next 12 month actually we take enough supply with us each time they have provision for at least about two years and they work day and night to get this off the boat ashore if the poor weather can get rough and then once the weather gets rough, we have to stop. And here you see our first encounter with the elephant seal. And they're enormous. They are enormous, that's all I can say. But they all live in harmony on the island. After we had everything unloaded, we made our trip to the other end of the island, which is called the Point, where the aurora physicists spent most of the time observing the aurora, and so all the provision for him has to be taken down to the other end of the island. We used a rubber pontoon to unload all the food and equipment. Here you get a view of the station from Wireless Hill. And Wireless Hill is something I'm going to mention later on. There's some very historic information on that hill. Looking at the building with the anchor in front of it was called Chippy's Church. That's where I spent the first few months with other five explorers just before the new sleeping quarters the Yellow Hut was built. The photo taken inside of my cubicle. This photo of our neglected old sleeping quarters was taken in 2013. Our first group photo, and I'm on the bottom row, second from the left. Now we're looking back at Wireless Hill, and the red circle shows a radio station which was built in 1911 by Sir Douglas Walson on his way down to Antarctica. Using that radio station as a relay, a Morse code sending messages from Antarctica through Macquarie Island to the mainland. And here, you're looking at the remains of the old radar station and the wooden pulleys you're looking at here were used in assistance with a flying fox to get all the material up on top of Wireless Hill. And the group of people you're looking at here 
where the expedition is who stayed on Macquarie Island from 1911, I believe, till 1914. And here you're looking at a signed photo by Sir Douglas Mawson as he stepped off the boat in 1914 after two years in Antarctica. And the note you're looking at was written at the time by the medical doctor, Dr. Archibald McLean. All the memorabilia one can view at the Mawson Hut replica at Hobart Harbour. Once again looking at Wallace Hill, you notice there is a grave and it was by an expeditioner before my time who refused to be operated on by the doctor and insisted that he be picked up from Macquarie on for the panics operation. Well, it never happened, so he died. Enjoying a few drinks after hard day's work. You're looking at myself, Laurie Brooks and Leon Fox who maintained the weather station from 3am till 10pm, seven days a week for the next 12 months. Being at the end of the International Geophysical Year, we use special neoprene balloons. We travel up to the height of about 30,000, 32,000 meters, and we track them down by radar for wind speed and direction. This operation required three people. Now we're looking at another grove on top of the plateau. An expedition also before my time crossing the plateau or walked across a frozen lake, fell in and drowned. And I'll have to tell a story about my own later on. The red circle is showing our old dining room in 1958 and the next photo, the new station in 2013 and a first class dining room. Winter is setting in and the display of the auroras is just unbelievable. Uh, it's very hard to explain it. it. It's like the atmosphere above you is just pulsating, you know, breathing in and breathing out of this just spectacular. Well, there are always elephant seals on the island right through the year, but the peak of population is during the breeding times when there are up to 80,000 of those big elephant seals on the island. Have their herons, they all have their own herons, some are small, some are big, but here you're looking probably at about a harem of 200 cows. During the period of 1810 and 1840, a lot of them were slaughtered and their blubber oil was used, burned and then exported over to Europe. In the back you see the old blubber burners they used in the 1800s, what's left of it. A fully grown bull can weigh four tons, four times as much as the planet's biggest predator, the polar bear. And it is difficult for any other young bull to get in there because you'll see to the collection of photos and some film clips, the fights which go on protecting the heron. When charging across the heron to keep other bulls out, very often the newborn pups get injured. And once they're injured, the mother abandons them. And you really feel sorry for them, but that's nice, there's nothing you can do about it. On one occasion, I followed a fight between two fully grown bulls, and they fought for 24 hours, non-stop. And at the end, it wasn't for injury that the one of them died, but was sheer exhaustion. It's completely bugged up and he died. Pups by about 40 kilos when born, and within 24 days can gain up to 120 kilos.
I notice that the skewers are always busy when the young pups are fed because they make a point of interfering with the pup drinking the milk and any overflow of the milk the skewer is there and setting it up. And once they're old enough you see them in the early mornings having fun, learning to fight, learning to swim, they're just having a ball. In our days we had some fun with the pups and we used to think of what's funny to have a little ride on them. But we never crawled to them. We loved the pups. Just having a bit of fun and being boys and didn't know better. Whilst living in harmony with penguins, they become very aggressive when it comes to protecting their female hair. Did it the old fashioned way. We weighed them first and then after that we branded them like you would do with a calf, would do with a bull. This way we could keep an eye on them and track them when they come back to the island. I suppose that was the early way of doing any kind of uh, scientific work on the seals. We have the occasional visit of the sea lion but there's only one or two ever turn up. But I believe there was a population of 200 to 400,000 fur seals on the island. They were virtually wiped out in between 1810 and 1840 by the sailors for the valuable fur. By the time I left Macquarie Island, there would have been probably about 200 fur seals on the island and repopulating again. Let's talk about the royal penguins, which has the biggest population of penguins on the island. Here you see them coming out of the water, making their way past grumpy elephant seals who don't like to be disturbed. And as you can see, even walking past them, they take very little notice of you, too busy to make their way up the creek. On their way up a little creek to a rookery which holds some 60,000 royal penguins. And now here we're looking at the 60,000 penguins on the top of the hill. And this here is a collection of eggs used for scientific purposes. As you can see, it's a hassle to get to the rookery trying to find your own nest by being picked at left, right and centre. and to use any means to find whatever they can find on rocks or whatever to build a nest and often when you see the nest next to them unattended they pinch the rocks from there and I believe two days after mating they lay their eggs The skewers can be very, very aggressive when they have young ones, more so than our Australian magpies. It is really something to watch how the skewers work in a team. They attack, they come in a pair, and one of them attacks the nest, attacks the penguins, get them to hop off their nest, and whilst the penguins are busy trying to defend them, against a skewer and hop off the nest, the second one dives down and picks up the egg. I personally have never seen them attack a young one, a little chick. At North Head is the biggest population of the little rock hopper penguin, the smallest of all the penguins on the island and probably known as a clown because of the funny look. 
But as little as they are, they're also very, very aggressive. They come right up to you, get their little flippers and block them around your legs. They, uh, they've got no fear. they just no fear whatsoever. And I suppose the name Rockhopper comes from because he hops from one rock to another. Whilst the Gentoo Penguin is a rather timid and friendly penguin and lays up to three eggs and build their nest more in the open in grass areas. On the way to the other end of the island, a 36 kilometres walk over two days with a 30 kilogram rucksack on my back, I too crossed a frozen lake and fell in, but managed to crawl out again and walk soaking wet for the next two hours to the halfway hut Green Gorge. Green Gorge in 2013. The next morning greeted by a visitor outside the hut. Continuing along the beach, my next stop is the King Penguin Rookery of about 70,000. They also were reduced to about 5,000 by the sealers in 1810 to 1818 for their blubber oil. Note here again you find young ones held together in the kindergarten style like the emperor penguin in Antarctica. I was forced to make my way back onto the plateau because there was no more access along the ocean. Now making my way down to Hurt Point. I promise you in the beginning, well here you're looking at it, 800,000 roll penguins. And the noise is just incredible. But it is amazing when you walk amongst them how they just ignore you. They just make room for you as you can see. One of the birds nesting on the island in large numbers are the coomerant, also known as the blue-eyed chag. Perhaps one of the most beautiful birds living on the island is the sooty albatross, nesting high in the gullies. Equally as beautiful to look at is the black brow albatross living high against the hillside. Like the sooty, they do not run or take off, they just jump in the air from their nest. Beautiful to watch. Living in the low grassy area are the giant petrel, a scavenger bird who eats anything and keeps the island clean from dead animals. And of course, the wandering albatross lives on the island and has a chick every second year. And you still see them feeding well into the second year of their life.
This one is about 13 months old and just ready to fly. It had a wingspan of 13 foot and 6 inches. In order to take off, they have to run into the wind. Our accommodation for the night and a new look in 2013. Here you're looking at the 16-member party of 1958.